Thanks for joining us for CBN Newswatch. I'm Caitlin Burke. The Israeli military sealed off the city of Hebron following Wednesday night's terror attack in Tel Aviv. Now Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu is convening a meeting of his security cabinet. As Chris Mitchell reports from Jerusalem, the murders of four Jews is just the latest incident in a wave of terror. Closed circuit TV and cell phones caught the terror attack as it happened. People in the restaurant scrambled for their lives. The terrorists killed four Israelis and wounded several others. Paramedics treated uh, around 10 uh, casualties, amongst them at least one in a critical uh, condition. We are still at the scene surveying and looking for additional uh, casualties. Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu landed from his state visit to Russia soon after the shootings and toured the scene. This is a, a savage uh, crime, murder, uh, and terrorism in the heart of Tel Aviv. Police shot and wounded the two terrorists, who are cousins from an Arab village near Hebron. They slipped through the security net Israel established to guard against these kinds of attacks. Most potential attacks are thwarted. While Israelis mourn the dead and wounded, some Palestinians celebrated. For example, Ismail Haniyeh, the head of Hamas, tweeted, Glory and salutations to the Hebronites. He also included a victory sign emoji. Hamas said it was just the first surprise in store for Israelis during Ramadan. This footage of applause and cheering comes from Jerusalem Arabs at the Damascus Gate. These pictures are of Palestinians in the West Bank passing out candy to celebrate the attack. So why are they giving out candies in the street? Because when a population is told that this is what their God wants of them, this is going to bring about uh, the redemption of humanity. Killing the Jews is a condition for the redemption of humanity. So of course, then it's a celebration every time an Israeli is killed. Itamar Marcus, director of the Palestinian Media Watch, says killings in the recent wave of terror are glorified, not just by Hamas, but also by Fatah, the political party of the Palestinian Authority President Mahmoud Abbas. During this entire terror wave, which began in October 2015, the Palestinian Authority and Fatah, the ruling party of, uh, of Mahmoud Abbas, have given absolute support to the terrorists who murdered four Israelis yesterday, who were captured by Israel, are now going to go to jail. And from this day onward, they will now be receiving salaries, monthly salaries from the Palestinian Authority. How can the Palestinian Authority expect the world to believe that they are fighting terror, that they are against terror? Marcus believes unless the indoctrination stops, murders like the one in Tel Aviv's Sarona Market will continue. Chris Mitchell, CBN News, Jerusalem. Speaker of the House Paul Ryan is making an announcement about his immigration and border security plan. The move is aimed at protecting national security. Ryan is expected to propose high fencing along with the use of technology and deploying air assets with personnel. He believes his plan will help keep out extremists, criminals and drug cartels. Now that Donald Trump and Hillary Clinton have secured their party's nominations, the next big announcement could be who they pick as their running mates. George Thomas has the list of possible vice presidential candidates. With Clinton and Trump facing historically negative views from voters, analysts say selecting the right vice president could make a difference in a tight race. I'm looking at the most qualified people, and that includes women, of course. While Clinton hasn't said publicly who she's considering, likely names include Massachusetts Senator Elizabeth Warren, Ohio Senator Sherrod Brown, Secretary of Housing and Urban Development Julian Castro, Labor Secretary Thomas Perez, Virginia Senator Tim Kaine, and Colorado's Governor John Hickenlooper. Home, Bernie. And then there's Bernie Sanders. Most analysts say neither Clinton nor Sanders have any interest in teaming up after a bruising primary. Still, Clinton is mindful that she'll have to work hard to win over her rival's fierce supporters. Because I think uh, his campaign uh, has been a, a really dynamic uh, and exciting experience for uh, the millions of Americans, particularly young people who supported him. On the Republican side, some people say I'm too much of a fighter. My preference is always peace, however. 
Donald Trump says he's looking for someone with experience in government, as opposed to an outsider like him. The last thing we need is Hillary Clinton in the White House or an extension of the Obama disaster. Trump explained what he's looking for in his choice a few months ago at a Regent University presidential forum with Pat Robertson. I would want somebody that could help me with government, so most likely that would be a political person. Trump has reportedly narrowed his choices to four or five candidates, and although he hasn't named names, those suspected to be on the shortlist include Ohio Governor John Kasich, Texas Senator Ted Cruz, New Jersey Governor Chris Christie, Tennessee Senator Bob Corker, Florida Senator Marco Rubio, and former House Speaker Newt Gingrich. As both candidates turn their attention to the general election, deciding on a vice president will be an important decision, and who they pick will also tell voters a lot about the candidate of their choice. George Thomas, CBN News. A federal judge has ruled against North Carolina State University for blocking Christian students from sharing their faith on campus. The school required members of Grace Christian Life to have a permit before approaching other students or inviting them to their meetings. Meanwhile, non-religious groups were allowed to speak freely on campus without a permit. The Christian students sued NC State, saying the policy violated the freedom of speech. The judge ruled against the university, condemning the permit policy. A Pennsylvania high school's graduating class will no longer be allowed to pray as a part of their commencement ceremony. Students at Potts Grove High School will, will replace the 20-year tradition with a moment of silence, according to Fox News. The change comes after a parent complained about the prayer during last year's ceremony. A school board official says the school has a diverse community representing multiple faiths. Many of the students and parents are upset about that change. The Southern Baptist Convention says it lost more than 200,000 members last year. It was the ninth consecutive year of decline for the nation's largest Protestant denomination. Their membership now stands at 15.3 million. Executive Committee President and CEO Frank Page didn't put a positive spin on the numbers. He said in a news release, God help us all. In a world that's desperate for the message of Christ, we continue to be less diligent in sharing the good news. But membership in the Assemblies of God is still growing. Religion News Service reports the world's largest Pentecostal denomination grew by 1.4% in 2014. A big Capitol Hill protest against this week's visit by the Indian Prime Minister. Members of the Sikh religious community say he allows persecution of their people. A legal advisor to the Sikh community telling CBN News that violence against the Sikh minority in India goes unpunished. And Senator James Lankford confirmed to CBN News that India has struggled with religious liberty, especially in certain areas. But there are s several states as well within India that within their state law uh, also bans conversion. Uh, so you can't move from one faith to another. There's persecution that happens in some of those regions, especially in the rural regions. We've seen churches burned. Uh, we've seen Muslims that have been killed in several areas. Uh, so the, the violence is real uh, that is there. Uh, they're trying to address it, and I've had some meetings and conversations uh, with their ambassador. Every person in every place we want around the world to have the opportunity to be able to live their faith. And for those of us that come from a Christian worldview, I'm not afraid for other people to be able to practice their faith as long as I'm allowed to be able to practice mine. Meanwhile, human rights activist Re Reverend Joseph D'Souza writes in the Washington Times that he believes India is heading in a better direction. He writes, I find Minister, Prime Minister Modi to be a breath of fresh air from a segment of Indian society and politics that has previously been far more hostile towards Christians and other minority communities. Coming up, ancient church icons desecrated and Christians fleeing for their lives. We'll take you to the Syrian city of Malula after this. FBI Director James Comey says ISIS is trying to recruit terrorists overseas as well as here in America. And he says the terror organization could pose another threat, with terrorists flowing out of Syria and Iraq and ending up in Western Europe. From there, they would have easy access to the U.S. Comey says the deadly attacks in Paris and Brussels would be a preview of what could happen in the U.S., with hardened fighters coming out looking to kill Americans. He says officials are, quote, laser-focused on this new threat. 
Come out, you Christian pigs. That's what Islamic Jihadi screamed when they attacked a mother's house, planning to rape and kill her daughters. Now the historic Christian city where that family lives is free again, after the Muslim radicals were driven away. Gary Lane brings us the miraculous story of this city's survival. Welcome to Malula, an ancient Christian city where the people still speak Aramaic, the language of Jesus. <laughs> Located 35 miles northeast of the Syrian capital city of Damascus, Islamic terrorists overran and occupied Malula in September 2013. Because of Malula's ancient history, it has become a symbol of Christianity. That's why the Islamic extremists wanted to control it, because it was this symbol for all of Syria. And that's why it was important for the Assad regime to control it again. The Syrian army fought aggressively and liberated Malula eight months after the terrorists seized control. But the town had already suffered much hardship and destruction. Militants left St. George's Church here in Malula largely intact, but they did their damage to the interior, like to some of these ancient church icons. The terrorists tried to erase Malula's Christian heritage by shooting up icons. They used knives to desecrate a depiction of the Last Supper. They knocked down this Jesus statue and broke it into pieces. And the terror inflicted on human lives proved even more devastating. They came here to convert the Christians to Islam and they wanted to destroy Malula because it's Christian. They shouted Allahu Akbar. They were from Chechnya, Egypt, Libya, from everywhere, Tunis, Algeria. They came with long hair, long beards and scary faces. Maryam El Zakam was at home when Islamic militants armed with automatic weapons and grenades approached her doorstep. They attacked my house and started screaming, come out you Christian pigs. I knew they planned to take our daughters, rape and kill them. So I thought of killing my daughters and then myself before they could get to us. I then prayed to God instead and asked him to give us a chance to leave the house. Maryam and her family escaped out a back door just moments before the jihadists stormed into their home. Father Tuthakid is the parish priest of St. George's Greek Melkite Catholic Church. We had a lot of fear, in fact, in that time, and people uh, began to leave Malula, in fact. Six young people, in fact, kidnapped, and we, know, we don't know anything about them, in fact. They also kidnapped 15 nuns who spent three months in captivity before they were freed in a prisoner exchange. Other Christians, however, were not so fortunate. Maryam's nephew Sarkis and two other men hid in the cellar of this house. The jihadists called out to them, pledging they would not be harmed if they surrendered. When they refused to convert to Islam, they were killed, three of them. In a show of support for the Christians of Malula, Syrian President Bashar al-Assad toured the town in April 2014. He walked through the rubble of damaged homes, monasteries and church buildings. He pledged to help restore Malula to its ancient beauty. The government felt it was important to care for the Christians and show their caring for the Christians. Of course, of course, not only because they are Christians, but because Malula became in the past a symbol, a symbol of the Christianity itself and the symbol of the living together between Christians and Muslims. That's why Malula was important and that's why it was attacked. Restoration efforts continue at St. Sarkis Monastery. It's one of the oldest monasteries in all of Christendom. This is how it looked days after the terrorists were chased from Malula. And here it is today. The monastery chapel remains intact. Built in the fourth century on the ruins of a pagan temple, it predates the Council of Nicaea in 325 AD. Missing today are 16th and 18th century icons, which once adorned the chapel walls. The jihadists may have either sold or destroyed them. And Maryam says the terrorists could have easily massacred Malula's Christians, but God intervened. I believe prayer had an effect. By your prayers, we were protected. While many buildings have been restored, it will take longer for the people to rebuild their lives. My daughter has nightmares and screams in the middle of the night. They're coming to kill us. While Father Tufik remains optimistic, he knows the Christians of Malula still face many challenges as fighting continues in their country. We are rising again. We are rising again. This is a step of faith, in fact, to have hope. Pray for us to have hope, more hope, because the difficulties are so, so much. Pray that God will not only restore peace to Malula, but to all of Syria. Oh,
Gary Lane, CBN News, Malula, Syria. Up next, a man trying to find loving homes for foster kids because he used to be one himself. Hear how he turned his plan into a purpose. There are nearly 400,000 children in foster care in America, and many of them are forced to move from home to home as they face challenge after challenge. Atlanta businessman Rick Jackson was once a foster child himself, and he faced those same problems, until an anonymous gift changed his life. As Charlene Aaron shows us, now he's giving back to other kids in need. 1,500 providers. Rick Jackson knows the business world and the success that can come with it. God has really, really blessed, blessed me uh, with uh, material success uh, from that standpoint. So, uh, yes, I, I have been fortunate. As an entrepreneur, he started a healthcare staffing company, which now serves more than 5 million patients across 1,300 facilities. A big difference from his life growing up. It was, um, it was very chaotic, dysfunctional. Uh, uh, my mother was an alcoholic. Uh, my dad left me when I was nine months old, and we had seven stepfathers. The Fox Theater here in Atlanta is filled with childhood memories for Rick Jackson, a time from when he was abandoned and rejected. But he has since turned the pain of his past into a purpose. I was between nine and 11 years old. Uh, my mother would uh, drop me off here on Saturday around 12 o'clock to see a double feature by myself and then come back most times and pick me up at 10 o'clock that night. At 13, Jackson ran away from home and spent six years in foster care. Once placed in a Christian home, he experienced the love he always wanted. I saw a family hold hands and pray. It gave me uh, a picture of how a functional Christian family works. Yet after about a year, he ran away again. I couldn't uh, take the fact that somebody would love me uh, like they did. He ended up at United Methodist Children's Home, where he recalls spending one holiday alone. During Christmas, most of them went home to some family member or something like that. Well, I didn't. Um, and I think there were a few other kids on campus that didn't go home. So, you know, I was there first Christmas. Uh, Christmas was always a big deal to me, and, you know, being by myself and so forth. It was a very, very sad uh, time. And then uh, I, I cried myself to sleep. The next morning, he received a surprise gift that would change his life. I had this white envelope that said, from an anonymous uh, donor, I opened it up and there was a $100 bill in there. And I was like, wow. After that, Jackson says life took a different turn. Mm -hmm. He eventually reunited with his Christian foster family, attended college, and at 21, began his first business. He credits that turnaround to a faith that was born during the most difficult times of his life. I relied heavily on, on God. It was out of the, uh, the pain I was experiencing as a child, and there was nowhere else to, to look to. That Christmas envelope put Jackson on a spiritual journey to spread goodness. One example is Faith Bridge Foster Care, which brings together local churches and the Department of Child Services. We believe that the church should own this problem, that, that in James 1.27, it talks about the what is an orphan. Jackson often shares his story of hope with those in foster care. I know that they wonder how come they're in this situation, how come their mother or father doesn't love them or doesn't show, I mean, or dysfunctional, or why can't they get their act together? Why can't they quit drinking? And what that does to a child is just says, I'm unloved and unwanted. And, um, and you know, I think the main message is that, that God does love you and that your earthly parents may let you down, but your Heavenly Father won't. He says helping others is his life's purpose. Through the pain of going through a dysfunctional family, foster care and so forth, it helped me identify just recently. My purpose, the reason I was put here on earth was to transform the way uh, kids are in foster care and to transform the foster care system uh, and to focus on solving that problem. I think that was why I was built here. A purpose he sees playing out every day. Charlene Aaron, CBN News, Atlanta, Georgia.
A CBN program in India is now celebrating its 1,000th episode. The show is broadcast in Telugu, a language native to India. So now thousands can hear the gospel in their own language. The show airs stories of people that rely on their faith in Jesus through trials and tribulations. It now airs four days a week on a satellite channel, reaching over 300,000 viewers. And it can be viewed in India, Canada, Australia, the Middle East, and even parts of Japan. You can find out more about what CBN is doing around the world by logging on to cbn.com slash international. That's it for now on CBN Newswatch. You can find more of our exclusive coverage of the issues you care about most at cbnnews.com. And tell us what you think about the stories you've seen here. You can do that on Facebook or at CBN News on Twitter. We hope you'll join us next time. Have a great day.